with us uh, people from the fashion industry, from the home industry, and from the pharma industry. And uh, with that, we have a wealth of experience in uh, what I might define as uh, high frequency shopping, like in the pharma industry, to medium frequency shopping in the fashion and home industry. Uh, we have high bill values, and we also have small bill values in the pharma industry. We have you know, businesses which are driven by customers, uh, driven by the fact that your product should appeal, uh, the product should be you know, part of a collection, and people buy on the basis of impulse. And then we have, in the pharma industry, people buying because they need, they come in specifically with a brand saying, I want this particular brand of medicines, and do you have that or not? And they normally have a list of about five, and if you don't have one, then obviously you're going to be stuck in being able to conclude a sale. So in some cases, supply chain is very, very important, and in some cases, you know, there is the potential for you to be able to shift from one particular garment to another particular garment, from one piece of furniture to another piece of furniture. So there is options available in some cases and not in some others. So what, uh, when I look at the topic, which is uh, the art of retail strategy, balancing innovation and tradition, and I think uh, Avnish took us through the journey of Neeru's, which was a journey steeped in tradition, but transformed by innovation. And when you really look at it, uh, and if you look at some of the other brands which are on the dais, what you can see is that you can't be only innovative, you also have to be traditional, because there are some principles of retail which remain constant over centuries. So the whole concept of transacting, where somebody sells and somebody buys, has remained the same. How they buy, whether they buy offline, online, how they pay, where they buy, open markets in the Roman era, or fancy glittering malls in today's age, all of that is the only thing changing. But the essence of retail remains the same. So which is why it's still a very, very traditional market. Uh, what I'd like to do is to be able to spend the next 25 minutes in posing a few questions to my panelists. Uh, and then we will have a session at the end of about 15 minutes where members of the audience could actually pose questions to the members of the panel. So if that is okay, then we could start now. Uh, I'd like to start with the lone lady in the panel, Suzanne. And, uh, you know, I think uh, Jayesh talked about the fact that you heralded in international retail in India, and the entry of IKEA was a concept which was awaited by a lot of people in India. And when you opened the first store in Hyderabad, it was a tourist magnet. It wasn't just people from Hyderabad shopping in the store. There were people coming from all over India to come and shop in the IKEA store because it is so well known a brand. So when you really look at the market, uh, you entered a market which is very competitive. It's not that there are a dearth of furniture retailers. It's not that there's a dearth of furnishing retailers or home solutions retailers. But when you came in, you created a difference. And what I'd like to ask you is that when you think about a retailer getting into a competitive market, how are they able to deliver a differentiated customer experience using technology? 
Thank you so much for uh, the question and thank you for the warm welcome that we got when we came to Hyderabad. Uh, we, are very, we think we were very fortunate to make the start here. So uh, how do we get customers to come back to us over and over again? And I think it starts with how you build the brand. I want to talk about that before technology actually. And we have taken eight years to build the IKEA brand to what it is today. Then today maybe we don't have that much time if you start a, a retail or build a brand. But I think it's the, the real starting point of how you want to position your brand. And um, we truly uh, have a vision of creating a better everyday life for the many people. So that's the, the reason for us being. That's the first thing. And when we talk about how we would like to be perceived, we say we want to be unique. So not like every other brand. We want to be meaningful, so we should really give a value. And we want to be trusted. And we have understood that the trust building part is extremely important here in India. So we are humble on the journey we are on, even if many know us, to reach the many people in India, we have a long way to go. So how do we use technology? I want to start with, uh, we are not extremely technology driven as a company uh, at first, so that was not how we started eight years back. So we are catching up on that journey. But what we work a lot with is to be cautious on how we use technology when it comes to customers. So I think the balance of how to use data is very important to protect also the customers. And you can think yourself how you feel when you are bombarded maybe with offers. So to really uh, walk the, the path where you do it carefully so you are not scaring off the customers. And uh, so we have a really strong uh, position on data management and the ethical data in the company, not to overuse the data we have and always protect the customer. But the way we do it is through our family uh, program. So we have around almost two million uh, family members and that is of course the real source of uh, data where we can uh, individualize and personalize the experience. So that program we intend to further develop, further improve, to make it relevant for our Indian customers and for India at large. But that's a journey we are on. So maybe that's a summary of uh, how to answer this question. Sure. I noticed in your designation that you're also the Chief Sustainability Officer. So I'll come back to you with a question on sustainability later in the discussion. So Avnish, if I were to you know, turn to you, and, uh, you know, it is fascinating to see the story of Neeru's from your original store to where you are today, from one city to 18 cities across India. And that's a journey which has taken almost 50 plus years. Uh, when you look at the business that you're mainly in, which is fashion and garments, uh, there's a lot talked about the fact that it is a combination of science and art. The science is in being able to translate garments into data and to be able to understand how they've actually sold in the past and how they're likely to sell in the future. And the art is in terms of being able to design products which are saleable, which capitalize on the latest trends. So when you think about your business and the fact that you've sustained it for 50 plus years in a category which is extremely fickle, which is fashion and garments, how have you managed to do that? And maybe some lessons from you for the rest of the retailers here, some trade secrets you might select to retain with you. <laughs> That's a little tricky. So I think we are all in some way or the other involved in the form of art. We are all doing retail and retail all comes with creativity. So I think everybody in the room is creative, but definitely um, uh, when it comes to fashion and we are into pure fashion, we are uh, the way fashion evolves. Every Friday you watch a new movie because India is driven by Bollywood, Tollywood and else. Uh, industries. So when you see your favorite superstar wearing something and you want that the next day in your wardrobe. 
So when you ask me, art is seeing uh, maybe Alia Bhatt or uh, Deepika Padukone wearing that on a screen. Science is to me that how can I give them that in next 15 days? So there's where the trick of art and science comes. So I think I can put you out this, uh, put this out in more uh, streamlined way by giving you an example. I think uh, whenever we had brand ambassadors, any A-listers, any celebrities whatsoever, so if we have them wear a garment, and uh, because it's a social media era and everybody's up there with the IoT and you know of internet and you know they would just see everything and they they're so impulsive to buy that they don't have time they want it right away so there were incidents when we actually shot a garment we put it up on our uh, social media Instagram Facebook uh, however and uh, that garment was actually maybe a one lakh rupee lehenga or a one lakh two lakh rupee sari and and you know we know being a British luxury brand that affordability for a 1 lakh lehenga or a 1 lakh sari maybe just 2%. What about the rest 80% who want that at one third the price? So then is when the science comes. We actually fall back. The science comes at the back end. We go back to our uh, embroiders, we go back to our weavers and we go back with our merchandising team and say that can we create this at one third the cost as an MRP and sell it to everybody rather than just going for the 5% of the people. So when the answer comes yes, then is when the science comes, you run behind, you get the costings and then is when your art of creating a new product at a very affordable price is the same lehenga, look and feel is the same but how you play the trick with the fabrics and the kind of options that you have in uh, uh, embellishments and then you create that and then in a very record time you have to give it back to the customer. So I don't have six months lead time in that, I have a very small window because I posted 10 pictures out of 10, 4 may click. So what about those four? I need to have those four as soon as possible in all our stores. Because if a customer comes, it's a big turn off today that if I see a poster and I say, I don't have this piece with me. And you're losing a customer big time. Then she feels, okay, you don't have this one, then you don't have any other. If I go to Ikea today, I like the nice wardrobe and you know, it's a nice fancy laminate. I go to a store of Ikea and suddenly I'm told, sorry, this is not available. You go for the alternative, I'm turned off. But if someone walks in from behind and says, wait a minute, I have that. I have it at a better price. I have it at your affordability. If you're looking for the same uh, wardrobe at 20,000 and not at 1 lakh, I have that available. And it's uh, there in my other warehouse. I can arrange it for you in the next 48 hours. You'll receive it at home. So that is the kind of gap that art and science create something, make something, but yet deliver it at the right price is the game of art and science for a person like us, for a field like fashion like us, you know, there is where we need to be very balanced. And even if you talk about fashion forecasting, nowadays it has become very this thing. I'll tell you one more example, the season's color was something else and suddenly people started liking lilac. You go to Zara or you come to Nehru's, you buy a menswear shirt, you'll suddenly see so much of lavender and lilac everywhere in the market, which was never a color. And we picked it up, somebody from our team picked it up that we need to talk about lilac for the next four months because people will definitely love it. It's a new color. Since past five, 10 years, nobody has asked for this color. And again, we kind of, in a record time, did that. And in our ethnic wear category, we were the only brand which was promoting lilac as if we have come with another brand called lilac. So that's the, again, example of art and science. You see something, but you make and give it, so, yeah. Good. Uh, in fact, in terms of supply chain speed, legend has it that uh, there are designers sitting at home watching television serials, translating the designs that the stars are wearing overnight into garments and selling it in the wholesale market. So that's the speed at which you know, something popular gets translated into product. So I mean, I have the same question to you because you're also in the textiles, garments and jewelry business. So if you were to think about this, then how would you think about the balance between what you sold and what you want to sell? Uh, as uh, Avnish has rightly said, that's actually our art, what people see. It's not just the movies, everywhere. So wherever there's a visual media where they're seeing that, this is what then the desire gets created in them. This is what I want. So it can be a, uh, it can be a sari, it can be a lehenga, or it can be a simple formal shirt. That's when the desire is actually created for a consumer. So having that desire, we have to work on back end and we have to give it to our customers at the right price point. And we have successfully did that for a long period of time. That's why we could sustain the market till now. 
and moreover the price challenge see we can't uh, now the price is not just the only point which you have to sell as retailers because now retail space has become more as an experience people just don't come to buy products from you because there are hundreds of people who sell the similar kind of products but what they are ready to pay for you today is the experience what you're showing them so experience is a big term it everything comes in that your store look and feel of the store interiors the elev elevation the customer service how the staff responds to you and how the quicker you know even as good as i can tell you the point of sale where the amount of time a consumer puts in selecting a particular product the same amount of time he wouldn't be putting at the billing system he wants it to happen like this if you ask him to wait in a line with his products he wouldn't be ready so even we we actually try to build our entire operations in store around the customer experience so it happens seamlessly this is where the basket value also increases so that's one of the important things which many retailers have to understand customer centric experience has to be created in the store otherwise uh, it's very difficult in today's age and the way you know just like in a flick of a second you can see so much content in your social media and as well as on your phone in the same way everyone's perception in the reality is like that i need it like this i need it at the swipe of my finger i need it things to happen like this so this is one of the important things as retailers where at what extent can we bring it to our store levels or at our customer experience giving that we have to think about it yeah jacob if i were to switch to you uh you know you run a very complex business a pharmacy business is not the easiest uh you've got a product selection which would be what about 100000 200000 yeah 100000 plus so, yeah so that's the range that you potentially can keep uh you've got supply chains which are very complex uh you've got customers if i were to call uh the people who come in who come in and ask you for you know different brands based on their local doctor who's prescribed uh, and then of course you've got to make sure that having come to your store they don't go out empty handed but they are actually sold to so when you really think about these businesses it combines a lot of things because it combines the science of being able to predict what people want Uh, it combines the art of being able to convince a person that there is a substitutable brand which they can actually use uh, it also takes into account the science of supply chain planning uh, and then of course god forbid if you have any things like a pandemic then of course there are various changes that you've got to make in terms of what you have to keep on your shelves which might be very different from the historical patterns so when you think of all of these things and you try to embrace it how do you actually go about doing this thank you uh, namaste korean and uh, good evening all of you hyderabad uh, just to you know go into the memory line i think uh, four years ago myself of nij and sandeep and all with mr rajgopal we have met in jw marriott first time to have this hyderabad summit and uh, very few people and from there now i know such a huge crowd thanks all our fellow retailers coming and participating definitely this help us and i just wanted to say that last you know one and a half decade we have been associated with ra lot of you know the engagement and support what we get so i want to just register that in this you know forum and specifically answering you know your the entire complexity i know you know you i think you know better than in terms of what you have put in very clearly the complexity as a pharmacy and i know this is as you mentioned very high frequency category but low bill value category and last year we served and 250 million prescription and that's a number 250 million prescriptions with a 400 rupees as an abv so it's like lot and uh, so that's very important for us to understand again the range what you have mentioned as you let yes 100 i know 1000 1 lakh around 1 lakh to 10000 the recognized brands in india in terms of pharma apart from that we are the wellness store so we need to manage equally the non pharma also which has a related categories of babies mothers personal care skin and you know the condition management etc that goes another 40000 to 50000 so 150000 is a kind of a overall uh this skews 
but at the same time it's very important as a retailer looking into your you know the capex and as well as the opex and in our you know working capital point of view it's not easy to have everything at place and uh, that too we have spread across 22 states with 1200 plus cities 5700 plus stores so it's very difficult the assortment actually changes cluster to cluster, as Mr. Korean mentioned. It's about doctors. It's about the prescription which is generated. Many of you, you know, really knows that the one single brand of, you know, paracetamol, everyone knows. So the Crocin that has 193 brands in India. So that's the kind of complexity what we have. But thanks to the team, our CTO is here, Mr. Balaji. The tech is plays a very big role in terms of creating this assortment, the cluster levels, and we understand from these transactions, and but yes, as you said, this is more of a data to look into our internal, you know, the uh, parameters to see what kind of, you know, the products, what kind of the brands, what kind of prescription drugs are going, and uh, this industry very difficult to fulfill the 100% of what doctor has prescribed, and uh, we have been working on this for the last, you know, a decade, we could able to reach 91 to 92 percent. Still, is 8 percent is bounce at our stores. So we are trying to really, you know, work on that. The technology, how this helps. It's all about, you know, reading each and every the prescriptions, and from there the transaction we need to understand. And uh, to just add one more, you know, the um, data point, we have close to, you know, uh, 33 million loyal customers. So we need to understand and what is that they really need, out of which at least 30 to 40 percent of them are chronic in nature. They are an NCD, which is your non-communicable disease, your diabetic, cardiac, and et cetera. So how do you see their prescriptions are fulfilled on time because they cannot miss the medication. So we need to you know, really read those patterns. That's where the technology really helps us in terms of putting it together. Then the important thing, how do you really collaborate with the the suppliers and manufacturers. And pre-COVID, it's all about transactional. So from the transactional, how do you really make this into collaboration? Nowadays, it's very important to share data because until and unless you share the data, then the win-win happens from both the ends. It's not about the consumer data. It's all about the, the pattern of you know, the movements, basically. So they, they can be able to really help us in which cluster, what kind of the doctors are really prescribing, and what kind of medicines we need to store at you know, stores so that we can be able to avoid bounds. The multiple you know, the, uh, parameters and uh, the kind of a logic what we have built in the system, the algo, so that really works on. The, the recent one, like, you know, the AI is what we have you know, really implemented in terms of to understand the disease pattern and the adjacent categories, basically, what they are really buying. Because sometimes we may just you know, see only the particular category, but along with that, today the person who has a diabetic, he has a co you know, the morbidity, basically, in terms of diabetic or kind of, you know, the deficiency of your vitamins and et cetera. So how do you find out? Uh, I think it's all about understanding and customizing the requirement of each and every, you know, the consumer, their needs, and uh, continue to engage and just see that this pattern, what it is arriving, and try to really work with, you know, the manufacturers and try to work on the supply chain well and before, and uh, the fill rates. I think that's where we are all really working towards. Thank you. Thank you. In fact, after hearing your description, I mean, I'm sure many here would not envy the job that you do considering how complex it can actually be. So Suzanne, I uh, wanted to just you know, touch base with you about uh, sustainability. Sustainability is something which uh, I have seen creep into retail internationally, uh, specifically in Europe and then into the US. But uh, retailers in India still haven't really caught up with sustainability. Uh, if you were to look at your own business, which is in furniture, uh, starting with timber, and then how it is made, uh, and the footprint that you leave, uh, both in the stores and in the transportation, a lot of that is actually great examples of you know best practices that you all could do. But just for the benefit of all of us who are retailers in this room, what are some of the practices that you think you all have done and which are also prevailing internationally in this space, given that it's now become a lot more important for businesses, uh, especially from this year onwards, in terms of ESG reporting 
and you know governments in terms of net zero commitments so what what are some of the things that you'd like to just yeah. share with us um so as as you said i'm a ceo and a cso chief sustainability officer and i'm one uh, out of 32 so every country manager has that responsibility to really make clear it's nothing we can delegate away we need to engage and we are all very happy to do so I have uh, 26 years with IKEA. My first job was sustainability manager. I was the second generation in 1997 when I started. So that's uh, how long we have been working on sustainability. And um, I think it has to come from within that you believe that this is the future. You have to have a very long-term approach. Don't believe that you can sell because it's sustainable today but tomorrow you will be a brand that is admired if you take that responsibility. But what we all along have uh, done is to say uh, affordability and sustainability needs to go hand in hand. Don't expect uh, you can charge more, that's not the right way. So we try to build products, solutions that are affordable but still sustainable. So it's uh, the combination of affordability and sustainability I would like to, to give out to everyone and really think long term for a brand tomorrow, you need to take that responsibility as a, a business and as leaders and as individuals as well. So it's just going to grow in importance. Uh, that's what I believe. Sure. Thank you, Suzanne. If I were to take sustainability into fashion, and um, Avnish, in your case, uh, we hear a lot about uh, how the younger customer is more conscious of sustainability, of the social good that the brand does, how things like recycling, slow fashion, uh, are now coming and becoming strong in some of the international markets. We hear about you know products being made from recycled bottles dredged from the bottom of the ocean, uh, and that's you know both into footwear as well as into garments. We've heard about upcycling in the case of denim. So how do you see a lot of these trends in your stores? Do you see this as a consumer-driven demand? Or do you see this as a brand-driven offering? Uh, I may have a different perspective to this because I think uh, a lot of, uh, in our category in ethnic wear, I think a um, uh, lot of brands who have tried uh, providing eco-friendly product line have actually MRP'd their products much higher. And affordability to that is very low. We are glad there is a lot of uh, awareness about this. but to get it to affordable price range is a big challenge. Rather, I think in our, the same point Suzanne made. Correct. It's sustainability and affordability. Affordability, that's right. So wherein, because if, if I walked up to a designer who has, uh, you know, spent her entire life in making only sustainability product, if I ask her what is the cheapest garment that you have, so someone in Bombay came across, she said uh, it starts from 16,000. I said 16,000 just for a kurti. I don't think that, uh, you know, this can be a... I said, how many people do you have? What kind of, uh, you know, numbers do you break? So that was too too low. And uh, she herself did not have a confident answer. No, 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 I can make the same thing in 6,000. I can sell 100 units of this rather than selling 10 units of 16,000. So there's no confidence because all that is available. A lot of designers are today doing it, but those are all A-lister designers who are using a lot of things in their lengas and sardis and all of that. But again, MRPs are like 1 lakh, 2 lakh, 3 lakh. So it becomes a point to sell or to do marketing. I wouldn't want to advertise something where I can't sell volumes because we are into fashion, we have our own way of working. So rather practically if you ask me for an ethnic wear person, it will be more like, you know, the fight between hand loom and power loom or uh, between uh, uh, hand embroidery and machine embroidery. So we have challenges like those and not like plastic bottles or stuff like that. So here also, because if you go for hand embroidery, like how Mr. Jayesh also mentioned that, you know, you have something in Calcutta you want to do in Telangana, I'll help you do that. So I was just thinking, can we really do that? Because I, from decades we've seen that embroidery, probably embroidery hub is uh, Calcutta or printing hub is uh, Jaipur or Ahmedabad. The kind of water they have, the kind of uh, 
or strength they have uh, and the dying capacity or the carigari that is there, the finesse which is there. So that will only come through them. So can we, rep can we skill them? And I think we can. It's only that havoc that everybody has created that no, this can only happen. That's not it. Today, if you have the same Mokiato in Hyderabad and same Mokiato in Frankfurt, so can't you give the same embroidery in Hyderabad and Calcutta, which is just two hour flight? It is possible. It's just that the initiative, same way handloom and power loom, a lot of the young generation of handloom weavers are not willing to get into handloom because they feel power loom, mein they can, you know, mass production, 100 sadis, 200 sadis a week, and handloom, one sadi in 20 days. So there's so much gap. I would rather put this as a problem in ethnic wear rather than talking about eco-friendly. Yes, we all want to do that. There is one activity that every brand should take up and do in sustainability. But maybe affordability is a challenge. If we kind of bridge the gap somehow in times to come, then we would want to do that and we would love to showcase it to the world that even Indian wear can be sustainable and affordable at the same time. Great, thank you. Uh, throwing the, uh, the questions from the audience, the floor open to the audience. We've got one hand raised there. Can we get a mic there so that... Uh, if you could just state your name and the question. Yes. And uh, uh, to whom are you... So I am from Kalamandi group. Uh, so I had the digital department there. So uh, I'm audible, sorry. Can you be a little louder? I didn't get you. Uh, I'm audible now? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So I would like to understand uh, three uh, points here. So uh, how, see in the, in the retail segment or in the fashion segment, so how have you imbibed the technology to improve the customer experience or uh, have you, uh, so that is the one point I would like to know from you. And the second one is, so what are your, what are your plans to go global? See, for example, you have shown that you have gone from Hyderabad to uh, India, of course, right? So uh, with the penetration of digital, so do you have any plans to slow down the stores and increase the uh, uh, e-com uh, in that way? So that's the second one. And in, in the third point about sustainability you, you, you were talking about, so all we all know that, okay, uh, the ethnic wear, we generally use only once or twice, not more than that. So have you any plans in the future to uh, maybe recycle those by buying back those uh, outfits? So that is the third question. So just to go chronologically, your first question being technology into the stores. Sure. So I think there is big uh, confusion when you say technology in retail, especially in apparels and uh, garments. Because what happens is if you give too much technology, even then people are not able to adapt. Supp suppose somebody comes to you with a concept of AR or VR and tells you your body can adapt uh, like a mirror and you know you can do trial systems. Somewhere personally, my opinion, that it doesn't work out. Because a lady wants to go to a trial room, convince herself first that I like this garment, I'm good in this, and 99% the decision is made within the trial room. Now you think how you can enhance your trial room rather than enhancing your things outside. And parallelly, in terms of technology, more than front end, you need technology in back end. That is your AI or you know how you want to implement your software, ERPs and MIS system where you get the data faster to you sooner and the right data. Suppose today we are sitting in you know April and Eid is going on. Do you know what you do, did in last Eid? What was your Ramzan period? What you sold and how many units? What kind of garment? If I have all data with me, I'm prepared for this Eid. Same way Diwali will come. So what I did in my Diwali and what my team is ready with the product line and all of that. So I think the technology bit is correct. You need at the back end more than the front end. Front end, it will confuse the customer. How you can simplify things for your customer, you think that way. Rather than thinking, I want a full technology driven store. Because if unless you're selling Apple, I won't suggest you. If you're selling garments, you think simplicity. And um, second point was, um, you had spoken about uh, the digital penetration. So, uh, do you have any plans to slow yeah. down the stores as uh, e maybe yeah e-commerce? Because so yeah, e-commerce again. I think we have tried uh, a lot in terms of pandemic as well. I think e-commerce we ha all have to understand three things: discount, price, returns. Isse chhota koi logic nahi hai because if you are a uh, you can burn money in discounting get into it. If your MRP is less than 5,000, get into it. 
if you can take the hit of returns then get into it getting additional top line and satisfying that i'm doing a 10 crore 50 crore 100 crore over e-commerce is a good thing unless you are a product which is e-commerce only which can only be sold on e-commerce because practically even with Nero's, we are not able to figure out whether I can sell, I can do that to the NRIs. They are very happy to swipe one lakh rupee on their credit card and buy four sardis because we are not available there. They want to buy and they have some trust in the brand and the system of payment gateway. But when it comes to domestic market and things like CODs and everything that you get into and the return game when you come into it and your pricing is average product is 10,000, 15,000 above, people want to touch and feel it. So to go global, you have a good dream to become a global brand. But first you have to see that, do you have the right formula to become, you know, a Hyderabadi brand or a Telangana brand or a regional brand or an international or a national. So if you have those things right with you, then you can take it up. There's no problem that way. Yeah, but the need is only so because as you are telling, so do you have any plans to go global? by setting up stores there or only e-commerce you would like to cater? So we have plans, we have done, we have tried and tested. Seven years ago, we started a store in Dubai and we are very, because of COVID, we are backlogged. Otherwise, we had very good plans of going abroad in terms of uh, US where we finalized four cities. Some of our team members are here nodding and saying, plan kiya, but kiya nahi. But that is obviously within our timelines. I think just how the world is coming over this whole pandemic game and when things are right, we definitely have a plan to go there. And we have also realized if you have to go to a big country like maybe uh, a US or something, you can't survive with one store. You need at least four five stores where your logistics work out, your cost works out and you know, so we are just planning that maybe in times to come, we would invite you and uh, to US and open one of our stores there because you have reinstated that idea into me again. Thank you. And the last question uh, about the reusing. Uh, uh, sustainability. Yeah, yeah. Sustainability. Sorry. Re reusing. Recycling, yeah, yeah. So I think uh, there was one concept I came across which was very nice. I don't know how far it will go. Renting your product. So I think recycling may not be because as you said, people wear it once. But if you're married and if you go and tell your wife that I'm going to take your lenga and make something out of it, lenga se pehle tergo kuch bana degi. So <laughs> we have to be, because it's very emotional, you know, people hold sentimental value that it was my wedding garment. People like to keep and protect it for a long time. I, I, I know my mother, I think they've been married for so many years now. She still has that sari and blouse. For yeah, some reason in time, she had to sell it. Imagine. Yeah, not the wedding garments, of course. Not Sorry. the wedding garments. Yeah, yeah. But uh, on, a, on a regular level, generally people purchase 20,000, 30,000 rupees saris, right? Correct, correct. So if, yeah. if not, not of course for the weddings. Correct. But uh, if they are purchasing 30,000 rupees sari and if they have worn once and if they want to sell it again, so right. do you have any plans to purchase those and then recycle that? Maybe maybe it's a good idea because for fashion, every five years, uh, old things come again back in trend. So if there was a bell bottom five years ago, suddenly you'll see bell bottoms are coming again. Same way in our industry, embroideries and everything come back. If things are intact, maybe I think we will try thinking it from our perspective if that works out. If it makes a change and it makes a difference to the world, why not? We can give it a thought. But things like garment rental has come. I don't know how many have survived. I think Biju would throw more light. We've seen a couple of brands mostly, coming and doing the, the US. rental. Mostly in the US. It's mostly in the US. It's just coming into India yeah. where tuxedos and gowns are rented. Yeah. But typically, you know, branded ones. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Another question. I, I saw somebody raising their hand. Yeah, there. And there's one person there right to the back. Good evening, my name is Ritesh Ved and uh, I'm a founder of a company, Prospero Enterprises. I basically uh, deal into the robotics and artificial intelligence. Now, as you rightly said that, you know, we are selling an experience and not the product and people usually come down to uh, buy the product using an experience. So my, my, answer, my question to you is, uh, international uh, markets have started using robotics and artificial intelligence. I would not target here the, of course, the, uh, the Indian, uh, uh, Indian market, I mean, not the uh, Indian apparel, of course, because definitely we need to try out the product. But for uh, big areas like furniture and the hospitals, now we are seeing that robots are being used for surgeries and robots are also being used 
across for non-surgical activities. So how does Apollo is planning to use uh, this technology over here? And coming to the show, And coming to the biggest, the largest uh, showroom IKEA store, uh, we find that you know uh, such a big store always requires um, a lot of guidance and a lot of assistance uh, from the existing salesperson. Wouldn't be uh, it be more convenient if we are you know trying to help the customers using technology make their buying decisions much more faster? Uh, trying to help them out whether the SKUs are available rather than we walking you know two kilometers across and just find one product over there. So I just want to understand how open is the industry right now to adopt robotics and artificial intelligence. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, two things you asked. Uh, the robotics, definitely I am not the uh, a competent person to answer because I you know, handles the retail part of it. Uh, and uh, especially coming into AI, yes, I can you know, really answer on the hospital side as well as the pharmacy ourselves, you know, we have done a lot of work. And uh, the hospital side, there are a lot of you know, the AI driven products we have done, especially on the bed side. And when you talk about the patient condition, you know doctors today, they are very busy. And uh, they have multiple patients to attend, the multiple problems of you know, the ailments and uh, related disease. So the most of the doctors doesn't have a personal life. And they have been round the clock. I think this is an AI what we have developed working with Microsoft. And uh, we have created the bedside, you know, the entire knowledge transfer to the, you know, the doctors. And wherever they are based on their, you know, the uh, travel, based on the patient entire condition, they could able to monitor whichever the city they are into. So that directly they can able to get this the, about the patient records, what is that the previous, you know, the readings and everything, and what are the elevations of the different, you know, the parameters. These are the stuff which is really, you know, goes to them. So they can able to take the right, you know, the decisions. So a lot of the you know, AI products which has been, you know, really uh, used in the hospital side of it. Coming into the retail, and uh, yes, as I said, lot of, you know, the SKUs, which is a very wide, how can we really give the experiences? Two things we have done at the pharmacy uh, level. One is that we have recently we have done based on the AI that you know the uh, uh, at the store we have created the endless aisle basically. So the customer is coming into the store, but we may not be having the product, but we know what is that really the adjacency that last time he has bought and what is the recommendation we can able to give him if it's a cardiac patient he's come with some kind of a you know the um, additional kind of a symptoms the system can able to tell you oh this is like this and we can able to give a recommendation engine that is basically basically it's coming from the data of a or the you know last 24 months of his transaction we can able to really you know do that algo that throws up exactly this is a recommendation we need to do so pharmacist can able to tell him so by taking this wellness product is going to you know, really help you. Apart from that, answering that you know the um, the product visualization, there is a one you know the set of um, category which is rehab because India aging population is growing and it has a huge category. So we have created an augmented reality wherein the consumer can come to the store, they can really, they can able to just see the product in the catalog. And this is a pilot in around 10 stores basically. They could able to see a wheelchair, how this will look like, how can I use, and from there it can able to convert that into the cart. And we can, they can really able to order an end to end, it can, you know, actually. These are the couple of, you know, the small things we are trying and, you know, we are trying to uh, help the consumers for their continuum of care basically. So uh, one more question coming to that. The reception process in a hospital. Uh, can, can we yeah. just keep it to the last, uh, to that other question which you asked? Sure. And then because we need to take one last question okay. before we close so, the session. So uh, to, to answer the, the question around IKEA and how we look upon technology to support the uh, customer. So I think uh, we go back to saying it is about the experience and the big stores we have designed to be. Or any sustainable clothing because 
you have a you know great brand which you know you have great uh, fashion designers which you can influence the customers in you know reusing the same clothes of course not the bridal collection or anything even party wear there are certain brands like on shark tank i've seen tween one coming up with you know solution to convert your clothes so are there any uh, plans of that and how are you planning to educate the customer or bring about change in buying patterns is there anything with innovative uh, approach? That is what my question is to you. Uh, see, sustainability, uh, it's basically comes with a cost. And basically in the current generation, many of them don't know what is sustainable. People hear this word sustainable fashion everywhere and I don't know what they assume about it. The Gen Z as well, it's very few people know, but sustainable see, comes with a cost. See, as he clearly said, if I go for a sari worth 20,000 I'm buying, it's not the one lakh sari. Let's take an example of 20,000 sari. If someone has worn for once or twice, if they want to resell, you tell me, are you, will you be ready to wear a reuse sari? I don't think so. Even if you have to pay half of its price, or if one, one fourth of its price, even if I price it at 5,000, a 20,000 sari, if I, they wouldn't buy it because for them, whatever the money they spend, spending on that, it has to be the good quality and good product. So not all fashion can be sustainable. There is only very limitations to it. Like if you go to the fashion wear, like high street wear, like denims or, you know, nylon materials or anything like that, which production of them again and again is a harm for the environment. Maybe those can be done, but not every product. In fact, I will tell you, Sari is one of the most sustainable product, which is actually <laughs> made from silk silkworms and that's the most organic product people do no matter it's a power loom and a hand loom the same material goes the machine itself is done by either hand loom where the person is there and the power loom the machine does but the raw material is sustainable altogether there's no change in it so it all comes down to what kind of fashion we can actually make it sustainable not all fashion can be it's different verticals of fashion are there and one more thing the main thing is there should be a lot of as brands we can do sustainable fashion only up to an extent. But as an industry, people should have a general awareness that, as uh, Susan rightly said, it has to be from inside. Like how we feel, it has to be sustainable not just for now, but for the generations coming together. If that has to be there, even the general public at large should feel that responsible that we should wear sustainable fashion and what is sustainable, they should understand. If this can be achieved, then that's a good encouragement for all of us to create more sustainable fashion. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, lady and gentlemen, for being part of this panel discussion, for sharing your knowledge so generously with the rest of the crowd. And uh, thank you to the audience for being patient listeners. Thanks for moderating it. As usual.